Hi, everyone, and welcome to Ask the Expert. Today, we'll be learning about new pets with expert Corinne Burgoyne. My name is Lisa Williams, and I work in the GBH newsroom. I'm also a big fan of our furry friends. I want to thank everyone that is joining us today, including our Leadership Circle and Ralph Lowell Society members. We really appreciate your continued generous support. Now, before we get started, I'd like to introduce the team behind the event. They will be moving the event along and connecting with you, but you won't see or hear them. First is my colleague, Bailey. Thanks, Lisa. Welcome, everyone. So glad to have you here. Unlike us, we will not be able to hear or see you. We hope you enjoy this event about our pets. Back to you, Lisa. Great. Thanks, Bailey. Liz is also here, and she'll be keeping an eye on the Q&A tab. Thanks, Lisa. Nice to see everyone today. Just as a reminder, we want to hear about your furry and maybe not so furry friends. So go to the Q&A tab at the bottom of the screen, type in your name, what town you're tuning in from, and ask all your pet questions, and we'll do our best to respond to them. In addition, please upvote the questions you like the most so they rise to the top. We have one other exciting feature to share with you today. If you want to uh, activate your closed captioning, just simply click the live transcript button at the bottom of your screen, and two options pop up. We recommend that you use the subtitle option as an easy way to watch captioning. You can also use full transcript, which will pop up a sidebar with all the text in the conversation in today's event. We hope you enjoyed the event, and here's back to you, Lisa. Great. Thanks so much. Um, without further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce Corinne Burgoyne. Um, she's really passionate about being people and pets together, and she works for an organization I'm sure a lot of you have heard of. The, she's the operations coordinator at the MSPCA Boston Adoption Center. She's worked for a decade to assist animals and communities here in Massachusetts and in Maui, Hawaii. She's got experience in animal care, um, animal behavior, trap, neuter, and release programs, and adoption matchmaking. She wants to answer your questions about adding a new cat or dog to your household. And Corinne also has a special interest in reuniting lost pets with their families. Um, why don't we begin with maybe the biggest question. Corinne, if you're here, can you tell us why now is such a great time to adopt a pet? Hey, thanks so much for having me. I'm really excited to be here. Um, why is it such a great time to adopt a pet right now? So I think that um, here in New England, where we're based, I'm sure we have folks from all over um, joining us, but in New England, we're really great at a lot of things and um, having focused on adoptions for a long time is, is one of them. I think, especially in this region, we're really proud of our adopted and rescue pets and it's something with organizations like the MSPCA that have been around for such a long time um, that adoption is really the option that folks uh, look for in New England. and. I think with COVID and the stay at home orders and people working from home and being in their homes more often, I think that there's folks who maybe had never really thought about adopting, but now are home and feeling like they want some companionship. And certainly the people who had been considering or maybe thinking about adopting have thought that now really is the time we're home more often. We have more time to dedicate to acclimating a new pet to our household, um, to just bonding with them that much more because we're home that much more often. Um, I think that if you live alone, it's a really nice form of companionship and love and something to get you up out of bed every day, get us outside, get us moving. Um, I also think if you don't live alone, if you live with family or friends or roommates, maybe some unconditional and non-judgmental love in your home um, would be a nice thing to have around too as a little bit of break from all of us who've been quarantined together for so long uh, so far. Exactly. And for those of us who, uh, you know, in pre-pandemic times were used to working outside the house, I think one of the things that may have stopped us, especially from adopting a pet with special needs or a puppy or a kitten, is we know that it really takes a lot of socialization time in the beginning. You can't leave them alone for that full work day. And some of us might be taking a little advantage of the fact that some of us are now working from home we're not used to. And it gives us that extra time to kind of get that um, new pet sort of started off like in a good way. You know, but I love the idea that it's the non-judgmental <laughs> roommate. Yeah. Absolutely. Although I'm sure some of us have had um, cats or dogs that seem a little judgy, especially when they want us to wake up at a certain hour in the morning. Oh, I have a very, I'm famous for having an incredibly judgy cat. So yes, I understand. I notice all of the um, questions stacking up here. So I, I thought 
Um, this is a great question from an anonymous attendee. It says, I'm considering my first cat adoption and wondering what the best way to estimate the costs of providing a great home to a cat. How can I make sure to provide everything they need? Oh, sure. That's a really great question um, that actually I just got an email from someone about this week as well. Um, so for the really nitty gritty um, specifics of the cost, um, I actually found the Humane Society of the United States. If you go to their website, it's just hsus.org or you can Google it. They actually list out a really specific high and low estimate of what you should expect for cat care costs. And you know, the first year is maybe a little bit higher because you're paying an adoption fee. You're going to pay those initial um, vet visits to establish care, you need all the supplies. And then from there, it's going to, um, you know, even out. And then as your cat gets older, you're going to want to expect um, that your vet bills may go up. Um, but that's a really great question. Um, and that's a perfect resource for it. So I don't have the exact numbers for you right now, but it's very easy to find. If you just Google Humane Society of the United States uh, cat care costs, they actually have a really, really detailed, excellent um, thing for you to expect. Adoption fees I can definitely talk about. Um, so at the MSPCA, our adoption fees vary based on the age of the cat. So um, kittens that are under a year are 375. Um, adult cats up to 12 years are 200. And then older cats cats um, are 100. And so those fees include them being spayed and neutered, up to date on their vaccinations, microchipped as a permanent form of identification, and then very often lots of other medical care that they've received um, while they've been with us that is just included in that adoption fee that would cost much more if they were your own cat and you had to take them to a private veterinarian. Exactly. And one of the great things about, you know, adopting a pet from an organization like yours is that you have that like all built in, right? Yep. You know, a lot of times if you're adopting or um, purchasing a pet from another venue, you don't know those things. And it can be, you know, it, uh, like you can run into problems that might be um, tough to deal with. You know, one of the uh, folks actually is asking a question that you and I talked about before. Mm -hmm. And she says, um, this is uh, Kathy Morris. Hi, Kathy. By the way, that was a great question. Uh, uh, anonymous commenter. I'd use your name, but I can't. <laughs> Kathy asks, um, I'm interested in fostering while I'm not traveling, but there seem to be fewer dogs to choose from. Um, you and I talked about how a lot of people want to adopt pets, but it seems to actually be getting harder to adopt a pet or harder to find a pet to adopt. Why is that? Yeah. So it's, it's, it's like this kind of perfect problem, right? If we, if there's a problem that we want to have, it's that maybe there are less pets in shelters that are homeless that are in need of adoption. But for those of us that want to add a pet to our home and want to adopt, um, we totally understand that actually right now it might be a little bit of a frustrating time. And so I'd like to just spend a few minutes talking about why that is and why it's actually a good thing. And then some um, other avenues that you and the MSPCA is working on to address that need. So as I sort of mentioned at the top of the show in New England, we're awesome at pet care and pet adoptions, which means that for the past couple of decades, MSPCA and organizations like ours have been providing low and um, no cost spay neuter to the public. So that's just addressing like the root cause of um, eliminating unwanted litters of puppies and kittens. Um, and then also over the past several years, we've tried to um, pivot some of our resources to helping people keep the pets that they already have. So when people come to us in a situation where they feel like they can't keep their pet or they're looking, reaching out with questions about surrendering their pet to the shelter, really kind of our first conversation is what's the source of the problem? And is it something that we can address and help you keep your pet if that's the right decision in the long term for you and your pet? So it might be vaccinations that are required for their housing. It might be some behavior counseling for issues that are making the animal a little bit more challenging to live with. It might just be resources of like food and litter um, to help someone keep their pet with them. So because of the spay and neuter and ownership resources that we're providing, we are seeing a lower um, intake of animals in our shelter, which is great. That's really good for the animals in our community. It means they're getting the care that they need and there aren't as many homeless animals. Um, so, but what it does mean is for folks like these people on this call who are really excited and want to adopt, it may be a little bit more of a challenging experience. So um, a couple things that are happening. So one thing is that because we have more resources and more space in our shelter, um, places like the MSPCA, we're able to um, 
have pets for adoption that are maybe a little bit more special needs, like you mentioned at the top of the show. So if you're able and you have the time and the resources, maybe you can be that person who can adopt a cat with diabetes or a dog who needs a little extra behavior help um, that needs like a little more specific home than just any home that would be a fit for just sort of your average animal. So there's that. And then there's also the option of here in New England, um, there's lots of groups and rescues and shelters and the MSPCA is starting to dip our toes into this to um, work with areas of the country where they don't have their pet population um, under control. So their shelters are really full to bursting and their communities aren't so much um, promoting adoption. And there are great, wonderful pets in those communities that could easily find homes up here. Um, so I can speak for the MSPCA that we have started um, in a small and targeted way, working with some shelters in the South um, and the Caribbean islands to have really good relationships with those source communities where we can make a difference in the long term. So we want to help the pets that are there now come to New England, find wonderful homes, fulfill a need here in New England, fulfill a need in their source communities, and then also help them solve the problem in their communities so that they are not in this situation long term and they can get to a place where their communities are um, really balanced with the, the animals in need as well. That's such a fascinating aspect of this yeah. story that we've done so well here in terms of providing resources for people that we're actually importing adoptable pets from different regions of the country. I actually have a friend who has a dog named Biloxi. And it's yep. because the dog is originally from Mississippi. <laughs> oh yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, that's one of those things where people love knowing that these animals came to them, you know, really in need and having some kind of story, um, or, you know, some uh, mystical origin, some, you know, fabulous backstory that they came from some tropical island or some really interesting place that none of us have ever been. I think one of the other things that probably folks on the call have um, maybe they've experienced or maybe they've heard about is that um, adoption agencies do ask you questions about, um, you know, your, your living space or your lifestyle in order to match you with the right pet. And Barbara here has a question. How's that matching process work? Yeah. Oh my goodness. It is like a science and an art together in a way that's really, really um, hard to describe. But I think that's a, it's a really good question. And one thing, you know, I can only speak for the MSPCA and our adoption um, philosophy. And so we feel really strongly that, you know, I hear a lot from, in, from people in the community that say, oh my gosh, I'm trying to adopt a dog or I'm trying to adopt a cat. And these people want more information from me than if I was trying to adopt a child, you know? And we want to feel like that adoption is an open conversation with people and then we want people to feel welcomed into our organization and then we're not there to judge them and we think that if people are walking through the door or these days calling us and emailing us they already have the best of intentions that they are there to make a match with an animal they want to help an animal they want to bring their animal into their family so for us really it starts off first and foremost with a non-judgmental open policy kind of process um, and then we really want to talk to you and have you tell us about your lifestyle and what you're looking for. Um, and so, and in a non-judgmental way, whatever your lifestyle is, that's, that's what you're coming to the table with. And so it's up to us to try to help match the animal to that and not the expectation that you should be completely changing your lifestyle or, um, you know, picking an animal that maybe isn't a good fit for you. So, COVID has really um, upped the ante for us on this because so often, you know, we have walk through traffic. So people come in person and they see an animal and they sort of make a, um, a physical connection, an eye to eye connection with that animal. And then we can tell them about them. Whereas with COVID, um, I think we were really concerned that that in person, you know, eye contact connection wasn't going to happen. And what we found is that people are so excited to adopt and so invested in adoptable animals that they don't necessarily need to have that eye to eye connection. And when we're posting adoptable animals on our pet finder page or on our social media, um, people are getting in touch just as much, if not more often than folks were walking in the door. Um, so we're gonna just wanna ask you like, who lives in your house? And who lives in your house might be as broad a question of like your nucle nuclear family in your house, but does your mother-in-law visit every weekend to help take care of the kids? 
and is she a little older and has some mobility issues, then let's not look at, you know, a really high energy 70 pound dog who right now is working on not jumping on everybody. That's one <laughs> of those things. Um, you know, we have sometimes cats that are really, really, really shy, a little under socialized are going to have a hard time coming around and are going to really just bond to one person. Um, so maybe if you're like a younger person in your twenties, who, you know, is moving apartments every year and kind of having a different roommate situation, maybe we want to find you like a more confident cat that's going to adjust to those situations uh, better. So it's really about matchmaking. Um, we do not have like an application um, because again, we think that an application sort of sets up uh, an opportunity for you to feel like you failed, which that's not the objective here. Um, so we want to talk and have a conversation and then match make based, based on that. Right. You so know, we don't have like hard and fast requirements. You know, I think a lot of people hear that like in order to um, have a dog, we require a fenced yard. Certainly not. We might say that this particular dog has a really hard time learning to walk, you know, uh, politely on leash, and it might behoove him and his new family to find a family with a yard. But those are very like specific situations, and we just think that like broad yes no rules doesn't really behoove the animals or the people involved. You know, somebody asked that exact fenced yard question, but yeah. and we'll get to that in just a second. But I love that you're talking about matching people with like m matching pets with environment and temperament. And um, Jane has a question here. And it, it's also a wonderful thing about her, her previous cat. Um, I have had a few cats over the years. My most recent cat has been a stray and the most cuddly, lovable cat ever. He lived with us for 19 years, oh. old enough to vote and drive. <laughs> and um, I would consider getting another cat if I could find one with this kind of temperament. Your suggestions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think that's a really great opportunity to talk about how everyone wants a kitten. And kittens are so cute and they're so adorable. Um, and of course, like every household would be brightened by the antics of a kitten. I think that um, a lot of people would do better to consider a three, four, five-year-old cat um, who's coming to us. You know, most of our cats um, are coming to us as surrenders from an owner situation where they couldn't keep them anymore for various numbers of reasons. And we do a really great job of getting a very, very thorough um, background on these animals. Um, folks, we help them fill out this really, um, really lengthy and detailed personality profile. So for us in the shelter, we can, you know, especially for cats, the shelter environment isn't always super indicative of what the cat's personality is because the shelter can be stressful and they can be a little bit shut down. So we have this background information that we can tell you this cat, you know, was the biggest snuggle bug, loved the kids in the home, slept with the owners every night. Um, and you certainly could get a kitten who could maybe end up that way, um, but you could also get a kitten who might end up being just sort of an aloof, hang around, do his own thing cat. Um, and, you know, so I think that that like three to five years old is kind of that sweet spot for like, if you still want a younger cat, but getting to know their personality. Um, and certainly, you know, a lot of the stray cats that we get are in that age as well. And if we aren't able to reunite them with their owners, um, sometimes those are the most outgoing friendly cats we have because they're the ones that let someone on the street scoop them up um, <laughs> and bring them into the shelter. So they can be, you know, that can be a good indicator too, that this is a really confident and outgoing cat. You know, one of the things that um, that you touched on a little bit earlier and you and I talked about before is the resources that you're doing to help keep pets and their owners together. Just think, you know, t now is such a tough time. Like, I, I think most of us have not lived through anything like this. Nope. And so I know a lot of people are struggling and maybe either folks on the call or somebody that they know, like, is like struggling and saying, I don't know if I can keep my pet. And I know that um, you guys have programs to help people keep people with their pets. Can you just discuss those and let yeah, people absolutely. know how they can so, get in touch with that? Yeah. So, you know, we just feel really strongly that we don't want ever, you know, some kind of temporary financial or medical situation to be a reason that someone feels like they need to give up their pet if they don't want to. Um, you know, I think we talked to a lot of folks who for you know, any number of reasons, keeping their pet maybe just isn't a good choice for them in the long term. Um, but a lot of folks who reach out to us, they have a solvable 
kind of finite problem. And so especially, so this is something we've been doing for a few years now, but especially with COVID, of course, people are struggling, people who've been medically affected by COVID and or financially affected by COVID. Um, mm -hmm. So some things that we're doing, so specifically we have a community outreach team um, who for a couple of years, um, I'm sure you've heard of like a food desert. Um, our team has used data to identify what we would call like a pet resource desert. So um, some areas in Boston that are, certainly don't have a pet supply store, might not even have a grocery store that sells pet food, certainly no low cost vet care, maybe not even a vet. And people in those communities have pets and love them, but they're all often our most vulnerable communities and the communities are most affected by these kinds of things like COVID. Um, so our community outreach team for a couple of years has been working in those communities, um, literally just offering free, free stuff, free services. You need food, we got food. You need a harness, cool, let me show you how to fit it. Is your cat scratching your couch or you know the door jam of your house and your landlord's getting annoyed? Let's get you a, um, a scratcher along with of course, vaccines and spay and neuter and microchipping um, as needed at no cost. So that's sort of like a, a program that we've been running for a couple of years anyway. And then with COVID, we've really had to ramp it up. So while we were, we, we would always give food away. If someone came in the door or walked up and said, I need food to help my animal, of course, take it. But COVID has really um, created a need for food in the community. So we have, um, you know, we have an Amazon wish list where people can buy food to donate to um, community outreach programs. Um, Hill Science Diet is a great partner of our shelter. So they also allow us to um, order food that we need for our community outreach programs. And so those go to uh, food, uh, human pet pantries that we're working with directly human services. So that it's kind of a one-stop shop for folks who are going to the food pantry anyway to get food for their animals. Um, we're also working with like some public housing um, uh, sites in Boston to offer the food directly to folks in those places. Um, and then as well as offering um, some direct no contact drop offs to people who might be housebound, quarantined, um, who really need that stuff. And so actually as of the end of last year, so from the beginning of COVID March through um, the end of 2020, uh, the MSPCA gave 1 million pet meals away for free. That's amazing. Yeah. I love that you guys are working with food pantries. Should they just go to the Boston MSPCA website uh, and they'll be able to find a way to Yeah, get so there's, um, there's going to be some resource links and one of them is to our community outreach program. So there's some information there about um, pet pantries that we're working with and also a direct contact if you or someone you know needs some help and maybe the things that are there don't apply to you or aren't in an area that you can get to. Um, and then just briefly, you know, we're also helping folks with medical needs. So we understand that things come up, our pets get sick, our pets get injured, um, and veterinary care can be expensive. So for a long time, our three shelters, Boston, Methuen, and the Cape, have had um, low and no cost spay neuter programs. Um, but we've really started to expand those programs into other veterinary care for animals owned by the public. And then we also have two programs at um, Essex and Neshoba Technical Schools. So between the three shelters and Essex and Neshoba Technical Schools, right now the MSPCA is actually the biggest provider of low cost veterinary care in New England, which is really exciting. And so we are able to help folks who qualify for other veterinary care, for emergency surgeries, for diagnostics, for things that come up. And so this is for folks who maybe are on public assistance, um, active military or veterans, um, people who live in public housing, and then certainly there is wiggle room for folks who have other extenuating circumstances and certainly who are affected by COVID right now as well. Geez, that's amazing. I had yeah. no idea it was so extensive. That's yeah, wow. Amazing. Right. Um, so let's see here. I did see kind of a related um, question in here um, because you mentioned Hey, if your uh, if your landlord is getting annoyed by your pet scratching and stuff like that, yeah. and so someone asked a question about living in an apartment building and having a pet, and they ask, "I live in an apartment building. Any tips for finding a dog that won't be stressed by the sounds of apartment living? How um, and how would I go about working with an agency to make a good match?" Yeah, I think that's like a really intuitive and astute question that I think a lot of people wouldn't even consider. So thank you for being so conscientious. Um, I think that's a great question because, um, you know, there certainly are dogs who are maybe a little more nervous, a little more alert, 
with everything. And if you live in an apartment building situation and every time your neighbor closes their door and walks down the hallway and your dog barks, that's going to annoy your neighbors. And then it's going to get to your landlord. and It's going to be a problem. So again, I think that goes back to the idea that we get these really, really detailed behavior and personality profiles on the animals that come to us. Um, so we could try to match you with a dog that maybe has a history of living in an apartment and you know was never had any complaints about them or just really has no history of barking at things outside or barking when no one's home um, and just try to make that match from there. But I think that's like a really a really smart thing to even think about. So good job. Yeah, super smart, man. I grew up with a dog that I once caught him barking at falling snow. <laughs> we had lived in a, fortunately, we were living in a single family home when we had him because I, yeah. I just thought about, oh God, Spanky in an apartment building. It would have been a nightmare. Yeah. So that's actually a very things, good question. Yeah. Or even, you know, things like, um, you know, we sometimes, you know, we have dogs that are really um, that will go home that are looking for that really special home, particular home that, um, you know, they're nervous around strangers or they're, mm -hmm. um, you know, the, they're kind of nervous Nellies. The world makes them really anxious. And so we, I would think about, you know, if you came and you live in a, in a big apartment building where you need to like take the elevator every time in and out mm -hmm. just to take that dog out, um, that's going to be like a really hard daily interaction for that dog. And so, yeah. you know, maybe you need a more confident dog who's nothing bothers them. Everything rolls off their back. Um, it's, it's really those daily routines that you want to find the right fit for. Right. Exactly. And it's so context sensitive. One of our questions gets at this. Um, how do you find a compatible dog adult or senior to adopt when you already have two cats? Sometimes you already have pets, right? But you might want one more. How do you go about making the right decision around that? Yeah. So um, again, we get to know a lot about these animals in, um, in their history. So I would probably recommend that we look for a dog for you that has lived with cats before. Um, we do at the MSPCA Boston, we do have a resident cat named Mickey, um, who's, he's really mellow and really sweet. Um, and he sort of, he lives with us in our clinic and he a little bit earns his keep by being sort of the cat who we walk a dog by to just see how it goes. Um, but that's not always a great indicator because Mickey won't run away. Mickey won't whack the dog on the nose. Mickey just lays there. Um, so I think getting you a dog that either has a history of living with cats or that just behaviorally we've seen isn't reactive to things running past it or isn't like so high intense about their toys or like when a squeaky toy comes across their path that they demolish it. So I think that's a really good thing. Um, you know, generally, I don't know if this question will come up, but it'll be probably, I think a good opportunity to, um, address it is like, I think people probably have a question about dogs living with cats in general or bringing a new dog home. And so, um, you know, we certainly recommend a really slow introduction, um, keeping the animals separated, certainly when they're out of your eyesight for quite a while, baby gates, closed doors, things like that can work for this. Um, as they're getting more comfortable, um, we really recommend just leaving a leash on the dog when you bring the dog home, which is kind of a good idea for any new dog anyway, just let the, leave the leash clipped on their collar, let them drag it around. No big deal. It's a little weird, but annoying. And that gives you the opportunity that if the dog does decide to chase the cat, jump up at the cat, it gives you an opportunity to, you know, um, redirect them from a distance instead of having a dog who you don't really know yet, who you don't really have a re relationship yet, having to kind of grab them or, or go for their collar in a situation that might be a little bit heightened for everybody. It's also really important that cats have places to get up and away. So condos, window seats, backs of couches, bookcases, and stuff like that. Um, at least the cats have an option to like remove themselves from the situation with the dog. Yeah, exactly. You know, find that right um, situation because I think so many folks have had both and had good uh, experiences with both, mm -hmm. but it does seem like the introduction is like really key, right? You got to start off right. And I love the tip about um, leaving the leash on. I'd never heard that, but it totally makes sense. Um, so in terms of like starting out right, um, Pat from Revere says, I've always been around pets, but never had to take care of one on my own. I want to make sure they have the right diet, vet visits. Um, would the MSPCA be able to offer guidance on being a good parent? Do you guys have classes or something like oh that? Oh my gosh. Yeah. So, I mean, I think first and foremost, when you adopt from us, um, 
we do that matchmaking process, right? We find a pet that we think is going to be a good fit for you. You meet the pet. We're deciding from there, are we all falling in love? Does it seem like a good fit? Um, once you decide to move forward with adoption, um, our staff is really, really um, well-versed and trained in doing what we call adoption counseling. So we will sit down with you. Again, COVID, we're doing a lot of these things over the phone. Um, so if you come in in person, meet the animal, then we'll have you go out to your car and we'll get on the phone. Um, and we are answering whatever questions you have. So we, we have information we want to give you for sure. And then we're also there for like all of these questions about what do I do 20 minutes from now when we get home? What do I do tomorrow? What do I do a week from now? We're absolutely available for that. And then we do also have a really incredible behavior and training team. Um, so this is anything from one-on-one -on -one consultations with a veterinary behaviorist for folks with pets that, um, you know, have some more highly specialized behavior needs that they need to be addressed one-on-one. Um, -on -one. We have a huge range of dog classes in all three of our um, adoption locations, as well as our hospital in Waltham. Um, so that's anything from like puppy socialization to basic obedience. We do agility, we do nose work. Um, and then we also, um, in pre-COVID times and hopefully post-COVID times, we do um, kitten kindergarten. So people talk so much about puppy socialization and how it's so important and it is, but um, the kittens kind of get the short end of the stick with socialization. And that's really important too. If you want that, like we talked about confident, well-socialized cat, um, they need to experience things too. So it's actually, a, I believe it's a six week course where um, kittens that are under um, about like 15 weeks you come once a week and they learn to um, go to a mat when you sit, when you ask them to, they learn to like touch their nose on a stick. Um, they also learn to tolerate some basic veterinary handling, which is a really important part of it. You know, we all know cats who just are completely catatonic when they go to the vet. And so this um, acclimates them to it's not so bad to have someone hold you, to have someone look in your ears, look at your teeth. They get lots of treats. They also get exposure to a really cat friendly, mellow dog. Um, and it's, it's, it's so fun. It's super fun to be in a room full of kittens. So um, we definitely have a lot of options for, um, you know, our, our shelter staff is definitely there for questions throughout the life of the pet. So when you adopt from us, always feel free to reach out. And then if there are certain situations where you want more specific training or behavior advice, um, the MSPCA's training behavior team is really, really valuable. Wow, today I learned kitten kindergarten is kitten a kindergarten. thing. And also who wants to go to kitten kindergarten and just hang out? I, know, I just wanna... right? hang out for half an hour, sip a cup of coffee, watch yeah. all the kids. <laughs> so I know great. we should sell tickets to kitten kindergarten someday. Honestly, fundraiser idea. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, speaking of which, we've had so many great questions from the audience. Um, we still have more to get through, but I want to take a moment to introduce my colleague, Sandy. Welcome, Sandy. Hi, Lisa. Hi, everyone. I think I will be first in line for that kitten garden class uh, for kittens. Um, thank you for spending some time with us for today's Ask the Expert event. GBH offers a wide variety of events made possible thanks to people like you who care about the work we do. And if you haven't already, we encourage you to become a sustaining member and make a donation today. Support GBH by becoming a sustainer at $5 a month, and we'll thank you with this WGBH vintage branded collapsible dog bowl. It's light and features our vintage blue color and perfectly portable. And all it takes is $5 a month or it gives $60 all at once. Go to gbh.org slash support events to make that donation and we'll send you right away this collapsible dog bowl as a token of our appreciation. Now more than ever, it's important to stay informed on what is happening in the world and your backing helps us provide information you can trust along with events you can enjoy. Show your fan of GBH and public media to all when you take your pup for a walk with your brand new collapsible dog bowl. Go to gbh.org slash support events today and every dollar you give makes a difference. Thanks again and now back to you Lisa with more. Thanks so much, Sandy. Perfect thing to have for all those pandemic walks we've been taking. I don't know about you guys. I've actually been spending a lot more time in nature than mm -hmm. I ever have. Um, you know, and uh, I actually hope it kind of continues after um, the pandemic. And I also just want to thank all of you guys. I know I mentioned to folks in the newsroom this morning that I was going to be speaking with members today. And they, they said, you know, thank you guys. It hasn't been a slow news decade, you know, and without you guys, we wouldn't be doing it. But 
before we get out of this event, I have to ask the fence question. Several folks have asked the fence question, right? They, they want to adopt a dog. They either live in an apartment or um, one of our questioners has actually a huge yard and fencing it would be kind of prohibitive. So what's the deal with having like having a dog and having a fenced area? Like what's, what should we expect to have? Like what's a good thing to have? I think it's so very situation specific. And I think that most dogs and most families can live a really enriching, satisfying life together without a fence. Um, you know, I can think of some specific dogs we've had in the shelter, um, you know, a dog who's lovely and friendly with people and is actually good with dogs. But um, when they are on leash and they see strange dogs, they are very what we call reactive. So pulling, barking, jumping, just having a total cow. Um, and, you know, especially for us in Boston at our shelter in Jamaica Plain, we live in a really densely populated high dog um, population neighborhood. And we just know from our experience that having that type of dog in that type of environment is really challenging, like challenging to the point that that's a situation where people feel like they maybe can't manage it any longer. So that's a dog that we might say, and it, and it wouldn't ever be a hard and fast rule because if someone came in and had tons of experience with a dog like this, we'd say, great, you know how to manage this. But maybe a family who otherwise is a really good fit for this dog would be best served to be that family that has a yard. And that's going to be the easier way to exercise that dog. It's going to be less stressful for the dog um, and certainly less stressful for the people. Um, but at the MSPCA, I can tell you that we are not a fenced yard absolute place. In fact, like we understand that that's because because also from a perspective of um, making adoptions available to everyone, you know, who has fenced yards, people who own and live in single family homes on lots of land that can afford to fence their yard. And we don't think that income dictates, you know, how much you love or how much you care for your pet. So folks who live in apartments and smaller houses on smaller lots, they deserve to have pets too. And Leash walks are perfectly appropriate. Finding places where you can play off leash, friend's house, your living room, if you move the coffee table out of the way, those are all really great options. And I think having a fence is no way um, a precursor to having a dog. Absolutely. Um, you know, and now it, it just seems like I, I see a lot, especially around here and folks, folks in the chat may see this in their town too. I'm interested to know if you, have you guys in your town started uh, seeing dog parks? I now have two in my town that weren't there five years ago, you know, for folks to play off leash and stuff like that. So there are options. I think one of the reasons people um, may ask for that is because one of the ways that shelters get pets is because pets get lost or run away. Um, and one of the questioners here actually asked a question about that. She says, Lisa mentioned your passion for reuniting lost pets with their owners. Can you tell us more about that? Oh, oh I could talk all day about this, so I'll try to keep it brief. Um, but yeah, so at the MSPCA, um, you know, we do receive a lot of found stray animals. Um, I think, you know, we're in a really high traffic area in the city. Also, because our building is attached to the Angel Animal Medical Center, which is open 24-7, we're often the only place that's even open or available if you found a dog running down the street at 10 o'clock at night or an injured cat on a Sunday morning. So we do see a lot of stray animals um, come to our shelter. Um, not so much dogs, honestly, and most dogs end up do going, end up do end up going pretty much immediately back to their owners, but cats are a little bit more of a sticky wicket. Um, so, you know, ideally if the cats showed up with a collar or tag, we'd be able to get in touch with an owner. Um, microchips are really important and we can, maybe someone has questions about microchips or we can talk about those in a minute. Um, but a lot of the cats come to us with just no sign of ownership or a microchip that has outdated information. Um, and our staff and myself are really, really passionate about the fact that people just don't know what to do when their pets get lost. Even like the most savvy, up-to-date animal owner, it's panic. They have no idea what to do. So I think that we have to be the experts. We are the experts in our community. So it's up to us to do the work to presume that this animal has an owner out there looking for it. I think historically in animal sheltering, um, you know, and in animal loving communities, there's this um, knee jerk reaction to presume that the animal is abandoned or that someone left it behind because they didn't care about it. Um, and I think that we don't know that. 
we can't know that story. So we have to presume that someone out there is looking for this pet and loves it, but needs us as the experts to find them. Um, so for cats, I'll share, we're really proud. Um, in two th 2017, there was a national study done for, for stray cats that come into a shelter, only 3% of them are ever reunited with their owners. Whoa. Our stats for 2020 were 36% were reunited with their owners. That's amazing. Yeah, it's, it's really cool. It's something we really enjoy working on. Um, and it's just, uh, it's so, it's so feel good. Like who doesn't want to do that to reunite lost pets with their owners? Yeah, it does, it does kind of make sense that, that it's more cats than dogs, although I had never thought about it, but like some cats are a little bit of an escape artist, you know, they shoot right. out that door when you bring in the groceries or something like that. And then you yeah, can't absolutely. Them. And people do have indoor outdoor cats too. And that's totally fine. You know, we even sometimes will have cats that come to us that we know based on their history or their behavior or some combination of those two things that actually are not going to be happy or have a fulfilling life inside. And so, you know, I think most house cats are going to, you know, live a good life with their family who provides them with toys and enrichment. But there are just some of those cats who, like you said, are going to shoot out the door. So let's plan on them having as safe an environment as possible. So again, those might be the cats that um, it's sort of like the fenced yard version of dogs where, um, you know, if you live on Mass Ave in Cambridge, maybe we wouldn't think that would be the best fit. But if you live in Brookline somewhere and you've got, you know, a lot of um, area around you and you're not too close to a busy road, that could be a great home for a cat who wants to be inside with their family, but also like insists on being outside and kind of uh, ruling the roost for a while of their day. Mm -hmm. Now we focused a lot on um, cats and dogs uh, during this um, uh, this hour, but we have one attendee who says she's had previous experience with you guys because she actually adopted a parrot from you guys. Oh. She says, adopted Jess a Quaker parrot several years ago from MSPCA who unfortunately passed away. Do you still take in parrots for adoption? Oh my gosh, yeah, so true. You know, most, most people focus on cats and dogs and the majority of the animals that we see come to us and need are cats and dogs. Um, but actually, if you add up all of the other critter category, it really adds up. So, you know, we do see birds, um, you know, fewer and fewer of them. That's so great that you adopted a Quaker. They're such um, funny little clowns. I really enjoy them. Um, you know, we see rabbits, guinea pigs, hamsters, rats. I'm a rat person. I have my own rats. I could talk to you about rats as well. Um, but all those little critters who also need care in homes. And, you know, um, we're really lucky in Boston and some of the um, surrounding communities, uh, in part because MSPCA has such a great advocacy department who actually works on legislation, legislation at the state and local level, um, that there are fewer and fewer communities where you can buy these animals from a pet store, you know, where they're being sourced from inhumane breeders and they're, they're being kept in inhumane conditions. So I think people don't always think about it, but you can absolutely come to the to the MSPCA on any given day and adopt a hamster, a rat, a guinea pig, a rabbit, a parakeet. You know, the bigger parrots, we don't see as much, but we certainly see them kind of on a regular basis. Um, cockatoos, African greys. Um, we even see some more exotic pets. We had a tarantula recently, which was a first for me in the shelter. Um, and about a month or two ago, we had a situation where there was someone who um, got in a little over their head and was overwhelmed. And we ended up having about 45 sugar gliders surrendered to us. I don't know if anyone even knows what a sugar glider is, but it looks, it's a, it's a marsupial. And it kind of looks like if a chipmunk and a, a chipmunk and a hamster had a baby. Um, so we had a bunch of those, which are pretty unusual to have in shelters. So we got a huge outpouring of folks who were looking to adopt those. So yeah, every, every day is an adventure and you kind of never know what's going to fly or crawl or skitter or walk in the, the door. In fact, your organization is kind of the go-to place for veterinary care for like exotic animals, yes. which for a lot of us really means a pet that's not a cat or a dog. And Absolutely. so one person asked about getting veterinary care for their rabbits and they say, you know, they love their rabbits, but their rabbits just freak out every time they go to the vet. Is there anything... Yep do to kind of prepare their animals and make it less stressful to go to the vet? Yeah. Um, I mean, I would think that, you know, we have a great exotics team at Angel. So I would maybe, you know, if you're going to reach out and make an appointment, 
tell them that up front. I'll be honest, I know a little bit less about rabbits than I do about cats and dogs. And so I know for cats and dogs, when we have situations where the, the animal is just absolutely beside themselves to go to the vet, one of the tools in our toolbox is to um, give them some um, relaxation, you know, a light sedative medication before you even leave the house. Um, I know rabbits can be extra sensitive, so I'm not one to say you should or shouldn't do that, but that would be a question to ask your vet. Um, I think also, you know, while exotics, veterinarians are important for these specialized species, um, I would consider maybe reaching out to some of the home visit veterinarians as well who might have some rabbit experience. I think of all these exotic species, rabbits are probably the ones that um, general practice veterinarians see more than anything else aside from dogs and cats. So there might be a, a home visit veterinarian in your area who is comfortable with rabbits. And it's, you know, as long as it's just basic checkup, um, basic care and not certainly surgical things or really heavy diagnostics, you might find someone who could actually just come to your house and, and do a hands-on exam on your, on your you rabbit. Know, that's a great point, because I think for a lot of animals, I've certainly had a cat who she just did not like the car. <laughs> you know, it wasn't so much yep. the it was the car you know, and the container. And like, yep. you know, um, if we could have found out that maybe a home visit veterinarian would have been a good option. Yep. You know? I, I don't want to let the hour go by because we are coming towards the end. Um, a couple of folks have asked about um, adopting senior pets, um, cats, dogs. One of, one of the person said, I'd love to uh, adopt a senior cat, but are they adaptable enough? Will they be happy with me? Another folk, like, I, I think there's just, you probably know, uh, more about adopting senior pets and what the reality is and all of that kind of stuff. So let it download your wisdom to us. Yeah. Oh man. This is also another one of my, uh, topics close to my heart. Um, so I really appreciate the question. And as far as their adaptability, um, you know, I think again, it's just like any other animal, we're going to have confident outgoing personalities and we're going to have, um, animals that are a little bit harder to adjust to new environments, but that's okay. I think ultimately, you know, a thing that we need to keep in mind is that um, while the shelter is a really bright, happy place with people who take um, good care of them and have a good quality of life, that's a much more stressful and, you know, less enriching environment than being home with you. So um, ultimately, we want to get these animals out the door and into homes. Um, but yeah, I think adopting a senior animal is like we're all going to go to heaven, whoever adopts a senior animal. It's one of the most noble things I think you can do. Um, I personally, uh, when you talk about cats, I adopted a cat that came into us as an 18 year old. Um, and he was just the, he was just the coolest dude I'd ever met. And I was actually the person who helped his family who couldn't keep him. And I came home for the weekend and couldn't stop thinking about him. And then I came in on Monday and I was like, this, this is my cat. I'm going to take this cat home. He was just the chillest, awesomest dude. We had him for a year. Um, before he, you know, kind of declined, but he was doing really well until then. Um, I also adopted a 13-year-old dog who was just the sweetest little being you could ever imagine. But I think, you know, I think it's a really good idea to think of it as like, it doesn't matter. You know, you, you could get an animal as a puppy or kitten and their time with you wouldn't be long enough. So having them for a year or six months or two years or four years or three months, I think, you know, while we might be setting ourselves up for a little bit of a broken heart sooner rather than later, I think you will feel really good for having um, had that experience. And knowing that certainly, you know, veterinary care might be more than if you're adopting a, a younger or a healthier animal. But I think it's also really important to have a vet who you feel really comfortable having quality versus quantity of life conversations with. Um, and having a vet who feels comfortable guiding you in situations where, you know, maybe all the diagnostics and all of the treatments aren't the right thing for this animal at this point in their life. And that we want to observe and keep them as happy and, com and as comfortable as possible for as long as possible. And that that is the best quality of life. So, um, you know, not feeling like um, that we have to do every single thing when we know that the end is kind of coming. Um, and that keeping them happy and comfortable is really the, the most important part of it. Absolutely. I think we have time for maybe one or two more, but one of our questioners was asking about how can you tell whether someplace that you're adopting or getting a pet from is reputable? Like she had an experience about like looking into getting a puppy and it sounds like she started to have doubts about it. Like, how do you like, 
you know, now with these big sites like Pet Finder and stuff like that, that go across so many places you could get a pet, how do you, how do you choose an organization to work with that you know is really solid? Yeah, absolutely. I think that's a great question that we've seen a real uptick in, especially with COVID and the demand for adoption as well. You know, I think that, um, you know, I think you can trust that a lot of places and people that you're working with are probably um, legitimate, but just like anything, um, you know, folks who are scammers and opportunists are going to see um, this demand and take advantage of it. So I think just like anything else, first and foremost, if it seems too good to be true, you might want to question it. So um, I think if you are looking at a page for um, something that claims to be a, a shelter or a rescue, and they just have endless amounts of different breeds of purebred puppies available, that might make you question because really anyone can throw up a web page these days. And we have seen situations where, um, you know, commercial breeders in um, different areas of the country will make a web page that is just vague enough to maybe make to make you think that it's a shelter, um, but that, that it's actually a commercial breeder. Um, you can certainly check in, you know, and check their 501c3 status and make sure that the organization you're working with is a um, registered nonprofit. Um, and I think specifically here in New England, as we talked about before with um, the transport practices and people bringing animals up from other areas of the country, um, again, because of our advocacy department, Massachusetts has really strong laws that protect people and animals in regards to transporting animals from other areas into our state um, to avoid transmission of disease. So one thing to know is that Massachusetts has a mandatory quarantine period for animals coming into our state. And again, that's really to protect the animals that are here from getting diseases that are coming in from other areas of the country and the world. So one thing that might be a red flag to you would be um, if the group wants you to meet them in a parking lot outside of the state. Um, that can often be, and it doesn't mean that they're not doing good work or that the animals aren't great, but it just might give you a red flag that they're putting practices in place that are trying to skirt um, laws and regulations that are actually there to protect the animal you're adopting and your neighbor animals. So that's one thing. Um, I think also just being asked to adopt an animal that you've never met, you know, being asked to commit to an animal that you've never met. And I understand that COVID times can be a little challenging. So I would think that the second best scenario would be that you can Zoom with the foster family and they can show you their behaviors and show you the the, the things that they know and what they're like at home. Um, but I think that that can be, that's a little bit of a, um, you know, a situation where the MSPCA would think that we really want you to meet in person and make a personal connection with that animal. Um, and maybe that group would allow you like a foster to adopt situation, or you could be a foster for them. That might be a good um, middle ground. But I think that the idea of sort of picking a, an animal from a picture and then signing the paperwork and having never met them um, would be something that would maybe you want to think twice about. You know, that's interesting. You actually answered a question that that was in the chat that I didn't even ask about asking about like what the background of that law was, because apparently there are some organizations that um, won't let people from Massachusetts adopt because they don't know how to um, fulfill that requirement or it adds a lot of cost. But apparently it's like, it's it's almost like a public health thing, except for, yep. yeah, okay. And the other thing that you um, touched on was how do you adopt pets these days when you can't visit in person? Do you guys, how, how do you guys handle that? Yeah, so, so we're doing, you know, people will email us or call us about a specific animal that they saw, or if they're not calling about a specific animal, we can have that conversation and maybe suggest an animal. And then we're doing all of that matchmaking over the phone and then if it sounds like a good fit, we make an appointment for them to come in in person. So we're not open to walk through traffic, um, but we are open in a very limited way for appointment-based appointment, appointment -based adoptions because we feel very strongly that you need to meet this animal in person. And they need to meet, honestly, they need to meet you too. You know, I think we focus very much on the, do the people love the animal? Um, but, you know, every once in a while, there's just a situation where an animal just has a funny reaction to someone that maybe reminds them of someone they didn't like in their past or something like that. So we want everyone to meet and be on board. So we're as COVID safe as possible. You know, we're keeping distance, everyone's wearing their masks um, and we give you the opportunity to meet the animal in person. Cause we just think that that's super important and really part of the process. Yeah, absolutely. There's that, um, you know, uh, almost like a first date. 
<laughs> you know? Oh, absolutely. Probably more important than a first date because do you go home and, and then live with the person that you just went on the first date with? I mean, yeah, it's really important. Absolutely true. Absolutely true. I'm going to call in my colleague, Sandy, for just one more second, and then we'll come back for maybe one more question. Great. Hi again, everyone. Thank you so much for tuning in to today's event. We really hope that you are enjoying this conversation with Corinne and Lisa. And as I mentioned before, it's so important to stay connected. Your support helps us to be a source for information you can trust and content like today that keeps you inspired. Today, when you make a sustaining gift of $5 a month, we'll send you this WGBH vintage branded collapsible blue dog bowl and show you're a fan of GBH and in the process, help us continue to produce content like Ask the Expert, and all it takes is $5 a month, or give $60 all at once. Just go to gbh.org slash support events. And to make it easy for you, we just dropped the link in the chat. So go ahead and click that and contribute what you can. Now back to you, Lisa. Back to you, Lisa. Thanks so much, Sandy. Man, this hour just flew by. Like, who doesn't yeah. like talking about pets, right? It's just one of those classic topics that we could all talk about for hours. But before we go, um, Corinne, how can people learn more about the MSPCA's work, about the resources that are available, about more about how to adopt or how to do a better job with a pet they adopted? How can they keep in touch? Yeah, absolutely. So um, we did provide a, a list of specific links to the chat that I know will be shared with the group. So um, I tried to pull out some really specific things about, you know, a list of our adoptable animals and our adoption philosophy, um, our training and behavior programs, our community outreach program. Um, so those specific links you'll be able to get, but also all of that information is available at MSPCA.org. Um, so you can visit and see, you know, all of our locations, our adoptable animals, um, our philosophies on training, um, information about our advocacy department and what they're doing to help animals in the Massachusetts area. Um, so you can definitely reach out there and visit us there. We also have a really awesome social media presence. So um, I'm at our Boston shelter. So if you follow us on Facebook, it's just MSPCA Boston Adoption Center. Um, we're posting live videos of adoptable animals. We're posting content about pet care um, and information about what we're up to. And then we also have a really fantastic Instagram page. So it's uh, MSPCA Boston on Instagram. Um, and that is sometimes when we have um, animal like kittens or kind of uh, animals that we wouldn't expect to see in the shelter that are a little more, um, uh, I don't want to use the term exciting because all animals are exciting, but um, are going to generate a lot of interest. We actually use our Instagram page for that. Um, it's an easy way to get that information out there to get people to join us. So if you follow us on Instagram at MSPCA Boston, um, you'll just be overloaded with adorable animal photos. I can confirm that they have an awesome Instagram presence. It is a quality follow folks. Yep. So go and do that. And who knows, maybe someday we'll see the kitten kindergarten stream over there. Yeah. I want to thank everybody. I want to thank you, Corinne. Um, this was a great session. And I also want to thank everybody who was in the audience. Man, you guys asked so many great questions. We couldn't get to them all. But um, we hope to talk to you again. Thanks so much. Thank for you so by. much for having us. We really appreciate it. Yeah, great. It was fun for us too. Thank you again. Bye.